So welcome to Gimme Shelter, Hermit Crab Forms with Mary Jo. Uh, Mary Jo is an artist based in Philadelphia. Their writing is published or forthcoming in Oversound, Philadelphia Stories, and Philadelphia Poet Laureate Trapetta B. Mason's Healing Verse Poetry Line. Poetry and essay, both read and written, has carried them through the last two years. You can find them online at maryjo.com or at Instagram. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to have those links down in the description box. And if you're watching this on Zoom right now, I'm going to post them into the chat. Um, but otherwise, Mary, please take it away. Thank you so much, Ishani and Blue Stoop. And I'm so excited to have you all here. Let me go ahead and share my screen really quick. One second. Can everybody see the slides okay? Awesome. All right. This is so exciting for me. And again, as I'm going along, if you have anything to add, either out loud in the chat, feel free to pop in. Um, this is really exciting to me because free online writing workshops have really been a lifeline to me, especially in the pandemic, and are really the reason that I'm writing a lot of poetry now. So this feels really full circle to me, and I'm really honored to be here. Thanks. All right, so just a brief overview of what we're going to do today. First, we're going to do a brief intro to each other and to the form of the hermit crab. And then we're going to go over some samples of the form. Um, yes, yeah, shout out to free online poetry spaces. We're going to do some brainstorming of some potential forms that we could play with. We're going to take some time to write in those forms, either using new material that we've come up during the session or old material that you want to bring in. And then we're going to have an optional share at the end and close out. So first, really quickly, we're going to get out of our shells for just a minute. So if you could just drop in the chat, if you feel comfortable, your name and pronouns, where you're calling in from, and if you could choose a shell for yourself, what would it be? And this isn't limited to actual literal shells. We have Anne in the room, Danielle, a quiet corner in a busy room, Regina, a leafy tree, Darcy, a shell of hard chocolate, ooh, um, and a ball of yarn from Izzy, Rachel, glasses, Ryan, a pillow, Crystal, pile of fresh out of the dryer laundry, Levon, a bookshelf, nice. And my show would be transparent, like a soap bubble, a mango from a shell, trees, my kitchen table, cup of coffee, the foam inside large headphones. That's very specific, but that sounds comfy. Awesome. Yeah, keep those coming in. These are good ideas. I want to take all of them. <laughs> all right. So back to shells. So what even is a hermit crab form, right? So it is what we would call a found form, meaning it borrows structures from pieces of writing or pieces of verbal text that already exist out in the world, like recipes, how-to guides, um, instruction manuals. And what I found from personal experience is that having constraints like that can really support your creativity. I feel like sometimes having boundaries around what you're writing actually gives you a lot more permission to expand within them, which is really exciting. And so typically what you'll see is that someone is writing um, either fiction, nonfiction, poetry, it can really be any genre, um, but they're writing within the form of something that isn't typically used in creative writing. And so you get this really interesting tension between your, pers your personal experience and a form that is usually pretty impersonal, maybe pretty technical or dry, which is a really, um, just a really interesting contrast, both for you in the process of writing and also for the reader in the process of reading your piece. 
And last of all, it's just fun. I really want to teach this workshop because I think it's just a really um, exciting way to just get the creative juices flowing. I feel like today's session is not so much about teaching you to write in a really specific way, getting your writing to sound um, uh, like a really specific form, but just to open up your imagination and remind you that there are actually a lot of different forms, a lot of different knowledge that you already have that you can use to drive your writing. All right, so we're gonna go into a few sample shells. Um, like I said before, it can be, this form can be applied across a lot of different genres. I feel like usually I hear it used with essays specifically, um, but in my experience, I think it applies across fiction, nonfiction, poetry, whatever form of creative writing that you wanna use it with. So the first piece we're gonna look at is from a book of poetry called Obit by Victoria Chang that I really love. Um, so you'll see that I copied and pasted the text into the slide, but on the very right hand side is what it originally looked like in the book. They're sort of arranged um, in these really narrow obituary sort of newspaper column type formats. And could I get a volunteer to read? You can either drop your name in the chat or just go ahead and unmute and start reading. I'm having trouble seeing everybody. So just, just go for it. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease. Once again, on August 3rd, 2015, the fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. <clears throat> when my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words in a ring around my mouth, like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wondered whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wondered what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. Thank you, Josh. So coming out of that, I have a few different questions for us to consider. Um, so Victoria Chang borrows really masterfully from both the visuals and the structure of a typical obituary. What do you guys feel like that does for this piece? When we hear that we're about to read an obituary, what do you expect versus what did she deliver? Um, how were your expectations met versus how were they challenged? And how does that make her piece effective? So feel free to either, um, if you know how to raise your hand, maybe that can be a way I can select people to speak out loud, or you can drop it in the chat and I'll read it out for you. So Crystal says, the four made it even more powerful. This is beautiful. And I see Anne's hand raised, go ahead. Yeah, I um, I mean, what you expect, of course, is that somebody died. And then when she talks about her mother's teeth, then you're not sure whether her mother died or didn't. So that was, um, there's a little subversion there at the beginning that you think it's maybe not about the dead mother, but you, and I think the other thing that subverts it is uh, there's all these, this specific information that's biographical that you expect an obituary, but it's also very personal, and they're about personal things that you wouldn't necessarily see in an obituary. So um, the form makes you think immediately about death and what um, you want to remember, but the first person subverts that as well and makes it seem very personal and becomes about the writer and her relationship with her mother as well as with 
this dead person that's kind of impersonally portrayed on the page of a newspaper. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so she definitely takes, like you said, the form where we expect to hear about a very specific person and we expect to hear about death, but she takes that and applies it to an object rather than a person. And that immediately creates a really interesting lens um, and really subverts what we would expect from seeing an obituary column. I see Danielle says to know it is modeled after an obit grounds it and gives it context, definitely. And I see Regina has a hand raised, go ahead. Okay, I would say that like in an obituary, we expect to read the history of the person or the basic facts about them. And in a way we kind of got that. We have what the daughter believes are the basic facts about the mother. You know, what facts are relevant to her, like the language and so on, and the words that she speaks and her orange blossoms. So I thought that was kind of, very touching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Abigail just said, really moving to get yeah. those personal details. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really powerful. So there's there's ways to both challenge the form that you're writing into and also ways to lean into it so far that you also come out the other end with a really personal and powerful piece as well. Alina, I'll have you be the last one to speak on this piece. Um, and, and I think you just said, what I was going to say is that I like how loose the fit is between the obit and the content. It starts out like it's an obit to her mother's teeth, but then it's kind of a reflection on her relationship with her mother and her, her experience of grief. And, and I kind of like the permission in it to meander from the form. I, I, I like that it just feels like, hey, I'm gonna start with an obit and then take it where it goes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's, that's kind of, that encapsulates kind of my philosophy about this form and what I want y'all to take away from it, that this is a really helpful starting point, um, but take it and make it yours, make it your own. All right, let's go to the next one. It's gonna be super short, so I'll just read it myself. So this is probably one of the most classic short stories or flash fictions, usually attributed to Ernest Hemingway. Apparently it might not be his, but for sale, baby shoes never worn. So again, going to these sort of news formats that you would typically expect to be pretty impersonal, but injecting a lot of personal details into it. And I think with this one, what I'm trying to get across is that your found form doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be elaborate. A single sentence can be really powerful. So moving on from that, we're gonna take a look at a poem from Sheer Ehrlichman's poetry collection, Oats to Lithium. So her book is um, a collection of poems about her relationship to lithium, which is the medication she takes for bipolar disorder. And this is one of those oats. So if I, could, if I could get another volunteer to read this one. And you can just jump in. I'll read it. I'm new to the group. Hi, I'm Isha. Um, okay, Odes to Lithium. The side effect of lithium is dehydration and peeing more frequently. The side effect of dehydration and peeing more frequently is not wanting to drink water at all because you pee more frequently. The side effect of not wanting to is not doing. The side effect of not doing is a couch in three movies. <clears throat> the side effect of a couch in three movies is what have you been doing all day with a raised, with a raised eyebrow? I apologize. The side effect of a raised, a raised eyebrow is a sigh. The side effect of a sigh is a plaque. The side effect of a, a plaque is a dirt road with your bike list. The side effect of bike list is an unrelenting heartbeat with a passion for waves. The side effect of a passion for waves is dream upon dream where every object is as blue as the sea. The side effect of overwhelming blue dreams is a girlfriend who listens. The side effect of this particular girlfriend is black soap that sits staining the side of the tub. The side effect of stains is her name in your cheek like a cool marble. The side effect of her name is your hands pulling chicken apart into a big bowl that she is also feeling. And every now and then, 
She shakes near your face, a ligament so nasty you both squill and it is good. The side effect of it is good is it is bad. The side effect of is bad is crossing your legs in the psychiatrist's office talking about side effects. The side effect of side effects is living your life. The side effect of living your life is dying. The side effect of dying is being remembered. The side effect of being remembered is being held like a stone. But of course, it is not a stone, but a bird that too will die. The side effect of a stone that is not a stone is throwing the stone and watching it fly. The side effect of flight is a poem. Thank you, Isha. So this poem borrows very loosely from a list of medication side effects. And my questions here for this are pretty much the same as what we went over with Victoria Chang's piece. What is her borrowing of a list of side effects do for her piece? You know, in what ways is this like what we would expect from seeing a list? In what ways is this really different? What does that do for her piece and what she's trying to convey here? And I see Anne, your hand is raised. I don't know if that's still from the previous question or if you want to speak now. Um, that's from before, but that's okay. I was actually about to type something in the chat, so I'll, I'll, I guess I will talk. Um, but that was my earlier hand raised. Um, yeah, Regina just said, I love the parentheses. I was going to write about the parentheses, which made me think of how when you read this um, uh, what they call literature <laughs> is that it has, you know, there's so much stuff that listing side effects that it gets overwhelming and you can tend to tune it out. And I love that if you tune all this out, it just says the side effect of lithium is a poem. And the inner part is she's written a poem and it reminds me of, you know, at the beginning, it's very logical and cause there's, I mean, it's all very, um, poetic, but it's like, you know, she goes from cause to effect, cause to effect until you get to plaque and it's sort of like, well, what is plaque? You know, that's like, a, what's it, what does she mean by plaque, which sounds like a disease. And then it goes into this sort of very imagistic, um, almost hallucinatory one thing after another, like you're in a dream and then you're back in the psychiatrist's office and it kind of um, turns back in to itself, but it still stays within the realm of the poetic. And um, I'm just thinking of how we, it made me think about how it's almost like she's saying, are you still paying attention? Because there's this way that you, if you get this long list, it's easy to start tuning it out. And then she does these things that keep you, um, keep your attention. Um, at the same time, playing with that idea that maybe someone reading a long list as a side effect after side effect would tune it out. So sort of playing with that reading experience. Definitely. Yeah. And I see a few more people also jumping in on the chat about the parentheses and how effective that is. Um, it also reminds me a lot of when you, you know, see TV commercials online for prescription medications and they'll just really quickly read out all the different yeah. side effects, just get them out of the way. Um, so her use of both personal details, also that chain of cause and effect. Um, and finally, that use of the parentheses really makes the piece a lot more approachable than you know, a regular list of side effects for medication. Um, let's see. Is there anything else in the chat? Laura says, stream of consciousness getting lost in a thought. Mm -hmm. okay. Ravarna says, the poem defies the linear logic of how side effects are usually laid out. The poem employs the side effects as a threshold for meandering into territories of surprise one image or idea that doesn't necessarily stack up against another. It's a poem ultimately about writing poetry itself and the way surprise is so integral to poetry and poetry itself as subvert normative rules. Well said, well said, I love that. The next ones, um, not gonna read out loud because I think part of their effect is more visual this time. So the next two, poems I've pulled from The Nation. I definitely recommend checking out their website because they have some amazing poetry on there. So this first one we're looking at is Leila Chati's Google. 
Um, the full poem, again, is on the nation's website. If you want to see it, definitely recommend it. Um, for this one, I felt like it was just a good reminder to get playful with it. Um, you can start with something as deeply commonplace as a Google search and get a poetic form out of that, um, get a launching off point. You know, you can incorporate what technology and what sort of the hive mind of technology is giving you as a jumping off point for your piece as well. Um, is there anything else that folks are noticing, finding interesting about this? I think another interesting thing about this to me is the use of repetition. So sort of similar to Shira's where you have a phrase repeated over and over, like for Shira, it's the side effect, the side effect. Here we have these search terms, but you get a completely different answer on the side of every single one of them. And so it sort of lulls you into this rhythm of repetition while also you know, surprising you with what's gonna come out on the other end. So I see in the chat, Danielle says it's automatically playful. Rachel says, I love that in this form, it is a snapshot of time. You could do this every day and get different results. It's very true. All right. So we'll look at the next one. This is gonna be the last example we look at. I don't think I'm supposed to have favorites, but this is kind of my favorite. I think it's amazing. Um, Oh, Anne said about the last one, and it's finding poetry in an unpoetic place, definitely. So this is another piece also on The Nation. Again, recommend you take a look at the full one because I can only show a portion of it. But Vanessa Angelica Villarreal, um, her piece, Table Border Collapse Collapse. As you can see, she has literally taken an actual found document and made it her own and created a form out of it. Um, I believe this is a record of immigrant parole cases and the results of them. And she has basically inserted a poem that is in conversation with both this document, but also the wider sociopolitical context. Um, what are folks feeling from this piece? What do you think she's accomplishing by inserting her piece um, and saying the things that she does say through this form? And I'll give you a little bit of time to take a look at it too. See, Josh has raised their hand. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I mean, something as as kind of bureaucratic and official as a spreadsheet. Um, you know, I haven't read all the lines, but, um, you know, there's, that's the shell, I guess, for, uh, you know, something much more soft and personal and, and kind of, um, and maybe political as well. I can't really, um, you know, commenting on immigration border style uh empire uh, all these things it's it just makes it very um a little subversive i guess mm -hmm. yeah totally taking this really sort of dry format of really impersonal court records um really data driven sort of order styles um brackets that are typically seen in like um, calculations with Excel sheets, she subverts those meanings and creates double meanings out of them so that people start to interrogate, you know, impersonal documents and what actually is going on behind them. Seeing in the chat, Lucas said, the repeated visual bombardment evokes the mechanical cruelty of these decisions. Yeah, so choosing to keep some of the original document um, really amplifies the sort of horror of what's going on. So sort of in contrast to the poems we've been looking at before where repetition played a sort of 
playful role, here we're finding repetition can actually play um, a really sobering role too. Mm -hmm. Abigail says another example of finding poetry in an unpoetic place, definitely Levon, she's making the unseen seen. Yeah, yeah. So that's another sort of um, power of taking a form, right? A document like this is probably not something people are gonna wanna pull up and look at on a regular basis by bringing her creative vision to it and putting herself in conversation with it. Um, it becomes a document that becomes a lot more alive to us. I think that's what she's trying to accomplish here. Danielle says, I do this with the word game phrasal. Within the constraints of the game, I basically create a plot for myself and then I write a poem from it. Very cool. Anne says, even in her poem, sticking to a limited vocabulary, repeating individual words that shift in meaning. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. So Danielle already got the process started, but basically, I want you all to start thinking about different forms that you're already encountering in your everyday life. Anything with text, basically, that isn't already explicitly a creative writing form, I think is fair game for a hermit crap form. Um, so there's things anywhere from a Craigslist ad, a quiz, a recipe card, um, instruction manuals, court documents, tarot card readings. There's a lot of possibilities. So that brings us to my first exercise. We're gonna do a little bit of a shell storm for a couple of minutes. Um, what feels possible slash impossible? What forms out there do you already know and maybe take for granted? Um, for example, with that last poem, I'm guessing she might've already had a familiarity with some of these documents or decided to go looking for them because that was a topic of interest to her. Um, even if it's as simple as knowing how to work Excel, you could probably create a piece out of that. Um, so yeah, as you think of different forms that might be possible for you or that you've already encountered in your life, go ahead and drop them in the chat, note some down so that um, you'll have something to work with for our next exercise when we start writing. And I'll give you all a couple minutes to just think, put them down in the chat and just get some inspiration out of each other.
Amazing. Y'all are full of ideas already. Good to go for our next exercise, I think. So either, oh, let me put to the next slide. So either taking a form that you've already thought of or taking a second to look through the chat and see what sounds exciting to you. I'd like you to choose one of those forms and write into it. Um, so you can either create material from scratch. You can look through some of your maybe old notebooks and writing archives and see what might be able to re be reconfigured into this new form. Um, or maybe this session might not even look like writing just yet. It might be research. So kind of like that very last um, poem that we looked at, maybe you have a topic in mind and now you're starting to think, hmm, what are some of the documents that already exist that are related to this that I can look into? Um, so we're gonna take 15 minutes for that. And actually one last note I wanna make is that if you find yourself going sideways during the prompt, in other words, you choose a form, but then maybe you don't really wanna write into the form anymore because there's something else that's really speaking to you that you wanna write about, do that, right? This is, this is a generative writing session. I'm just trying to provide you a jumping off point. Do whatever feels good for you. Um, great. So we'll take 15 minutes for that. I'll make sure to give you all a five minute and one minute warning, and then we'll all come back together and do an optional share. So I will start the timer now and go for it.
All right, one minute left, folks. So wrap up your final thoughts. All right, and that's time. So now we're gonna have completely optional share. So folks can take about a minute to either share directly what they've written or to share a little bit about your process, what you're taking away from today, whatever about today you wanna share. Um, I also wanna say that if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you wanna share anonymously, you can feel free to send me a direct chat um, and ask that I read it out without your name. I'm happy to do that as well. I also want to say sharing is a really brave, vulnerable thing to do, especially in a room full of people who you don't necessarily know. So please show each other some love, drop things in the chat if they resonate. Um, how are you re reacting to things? Use your Zoom reactions, all that stuff. All right. I see Trevarna, drop something in the chat. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit tricky for me to read the whole thing out loud. So definitely take a look at it and read it. Oh, I'm seeing Trevarna actually wants me to read their piece, definitely. So a questionnaire for my late grandfather. Where were you when he died? A, in bristling melon grass sprawled over the ridge of a burning field. B, in my best friend's pink walled room overhung with chiming fluorescent fairy lights. Or C, in my yellow car, even the sunlight refusing to touch it. What were you doing? Lifting a sparrow from under a canal in the field, feeding it a bottle of oat milk. Playing Scrabble with my friend, waiting for her to form her next words. Sleeping with my head propped up on my car's velvet couch. What do you regret? Not bringing my grandfather enough oak wood from the field one last time for him to smell it. Not making the last phone call, the phone's buzz warming his chest pocket not crying, no, not even turning my face to the window so that I could catch the winter dust fading sunlight. It's really beautiful. I can read what I wrote. Go for it. Um, I actually was inspired by Obit. Uh, I've been thinking about and working through like who I was before the pandemic versus who I am now. 
Does it change to everybody? Uh, so they call it uh, pre-pandemic crystal, 34, expires. March 15, 2020, Crystal took her last breath in the middle of the office that now hosts mold and dust. She gathered some supplies in both confusion and preparation, not knowing the return. She answered emails of future projects that were, po that were postponed that will later go on to die. She returned phone calls, issued refunds, and consoled concerned customers. No one knew what was coming. She stopped at the store on her way home to grab whatever made it through the panic. She put on her PJs, had a glass of wine, ate a snack while watching TV and froze as life stood still. The last day she was this crystal. Hmm. Nice. See Josh, raise your hand, go ahead. Um, I, I uh, found a depression questionnaire on a website like a university hospital website and uh i've dealt with depression i mean that's probably a pretty common thing to say these days but um so i so it went like this uh patient health questionnaire phq-9 name date over the last two weeks how often have you been bothered by the following problems you have been walking at a brisk pace just because you had springs in your knees. Not at all. Several days, more than half the days, nearly every day. Uh, zero, one, two, three. Uh, forgotten where you were momentarily because you were so absorbed in what you were doing. Zero, one, two, three. Two, felt like your love for your dog was a mirror down the middle. Zero, one, two, three. Three, felt like your future could happen at any moment. Zero, one, two, three. Four, felt like death was only a rumor. Zero, one, two, three. Five, had trouble being patient with the person delivering your Amazon package. Zero, one, two, three. Uh, feeling like your success was begetting much more than you ever thought you could have. Zero, one, two, three. Six, we're contented with a backache. Seven, zero, one, two, three. Realized that movement is a gift as is its exhaustion. Zero, one, two, three, and that's as far as I got. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, it's kind of a reflection of where I come from and now where I am today. I, I don't suffer that much uh, from that kind of thing these days. And that's, you know, that's a real, you know, something to be relieved about. And it's nice to have a reminder and, and to try to use poetic language to kind of lightly describe what is wonderful about life. Absolutely. And that's why I wrote that, thanks. Awesome, thanks so much for sharing. And I can see that being a really powerful reflection tool for other folks as well, if you ever decide to share it. Thank you. So I'm seeing in the chat, a lot of other great ideas from folks. Darcy took subject lines from emails. Um, Isabella took a meeting agenda and listicle. I see Anne played with a reminders list. Rachel used the Google fill in form method. Abigail worked with a check and a vehicle title. Isha, pharmacy subscriptions. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. Danielle photocopied an open face notebook. Very cool. And Anne has a totally found poem via auto text. Um, we're running out of time, but Anne, if you have a really quick excerpt from it, if you want to share. Yeah, it's pretty short. Um, 
and it was totally auto text. I just started typing in words and then it would generate new words and I would add them on my notes format notes. Um, change the schedules and schedules firsthand have not yet done so much more about the weather in a rain night for sure. Hope you're having fun on health, como siempre te. He is fine, but it looks so much more. And then the restaurants forget your order. Thanksgiving lunch with your family. Happy birthday, dear happy girl. I can call you when you leave heresy, if you're ready made. We are in church with ourselves, tools forwarded. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Fun oh, yeah just fun <laughs> awesome well that's the end of our time today thank you all so much for making the time for your time and attention for all your creativity like i said you guys already all came in with all these ideas i just encourage you to go out and run with them um so again thank you all thank you also to shawnee and blue stoop for having me this is really fun hope you all have a good rest of your weeks thank you, thank you so much everyone thank you Absolutely loved this session. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw those links back in the chat for those who are interested. And I hope that I see you next Wednesday. Thanks so much again. Thank you.